So as we're moving toward the close of our visit to Venavana Monastery, the bamboo grove in Rajgiri, Bihar. Um, like I was saying, it's, it's very well laid out. I like the old style lamp post, the pathways, the bridges, connecting two sections. Um, they got a variety of um, types of walkways. Some of it's closed off, like I think they're getting ready for the season and doing repairs. Monsoon season can sometimes be quite devastating or at least lead to a lot of uh, renovation work and um, fix it up or type of jobs to roads and paths and buildings. Um, so we've got a lot of gardening going on today. All right, so looking up at the hill, I wanted to go ahead and discuss this. So um, I, I wound up with a few disappointments uh, today. So starting last night, we went to, um, to hire a driver to go to some areas around Bodh Gaya um, before we make our way up toward Darjeeling. And so there was a lot of ground to cover. So we wanted to go to um, several sites. Um, besides Rajgiri and Nalanda, we wanted to go to um, uh, the Barabara Bar Bar Caves, which were the some of the first rock cut caves in India and in the world, I believe. Um, they're very fascinating because uh, they were commissioned by Emperor Ashoka for the Ajivkas. Um, they were um, one of the, the shramanic movements at the same time as the Buddha in Mahavira and the Jains. Um, and let's see if I can, unfortunately I don't have, I need to get a, a, a proper camera. But you can see there's a Buddhist shrine up there, all the rock formations on the hillside. There are five mountains here at Rajgiri. But um, so unfortunately, th so this, this cave, these caves, um, including the Loma Rishi cave, um, they're made out of granite and um, they have one of them has a very elaborate gateway and they're designed almost like huts in some ways um, you know like where wood features are carved directly into the stone and then they have amazing acoustics inside and this one in particular they polished they called it a Morian polish and they polished the walls so that it's 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 like a mirror and um, so this mirror-like polish um, would have been amazing if it was if the if the cave was full of candles and people were chanting. The acoustics are very powerful, and so it would have been been just amazing to have have listened to um, the discourses and the chanting with the candles and the glimmering in the mirror-like environment of the cave in ancient times. Um, I'm not sure if there's something comparable in our modern world with any caves if people have uh, duplicated the technologies or if we even properly understand the technologies so unfortunately because of the monsoons the roads are, are difficult and so we weren't able to go there and it would have required a full day and we've only got one full day to see as much as possible so that was out and then the second place was i wanted to go to um coxfoot mountain which is a, a very beautiful mountain um, um, I believe it's near the village of Gurpa and it's a location um, where the the uh, the Buddha's main like one of his most important disciples Maha Kasapa I believe he um, meditated there at the end of his life and one of the legends is that he he was the one who inherited the, the Buddha's robe and he was uh, and at the end of his life he opened up the mountain opened up a cave and went inside to meditate until the end of uh, time or until um, the next Buddha to, to come, Maitreya, the, the, um, which reflects Maitri or Metta, so loving kindness, the one who brings loving kindness, like uh, he will go and visit him and he will receive the robe is the story. So this is a beautiful place and many, many of the great meditators of the Buddhist tradition have spent time there. Um, including uh because a little under 2000 years maybe eight, 1800 to 2000 years ago there were big cults uh devoted to um 
being reborn during the time of the next Buddha to come of Maitreya. And so um, I believe it was a Sangha and or maybe his brother Vasubandhu, who um, which are connected to the um, Yogacara schools and the Sutrantika schools of ancient Buddhism, philosophical and meditation schools. Um, one of them, he went and spent an extensive period of time there um, to, to attempt to meet Maitreya. Um, and there's some interesting stories. Um, so anyway, I wanted to go and, and see this area that, that many great contemplatives had spent time. And it's supposed to be one of the prettiest areas in the region. Um, covered, it's mountain covered in jungle. And so I didn't get a chance to go there, unfortunately. And then today I wanted to go to a place located here in, um, in Rajgiri, um, which is uh, Septaparni Cave. This is the place where the first Buddhist council took place six months after the Parinibbana or death of the Buddha in order to um, uh, basically confirm and classify the Buddhist scriptures, the Tipitaka. And 500 of the Buddha's closest disciples that were enlightened, called the Arhants, they participated in, um, in this uh, council. It would have taken place, like I said, six months after the Buddha died, 2,500 years ago. Um, and uh, so it's a quite, quite, a, uh, quite an interesting place. Um, I had gone there many years ago, and it's a really lovely location. And I had planned on making a few videos from there. Because it's, it's just, it's, uh, and it's on a hill with a lot of Jain temples. Um, because Mahavira was very associated with this location as well as the Buddha. Which is interesting when you just think about uh, important religious traditions and people not only living at the same time, but maybe even meeting and spending time together and influencing one another. I believe that the Jains, if I'm remembering correctly, and, and tell me in the comments, um, the Jains actually, some of them, I believe, had claimed that the Buddha was part of their movement and broke away and was... Um, a, a deviant, like a, um, you know, like a heretic, or a, he had he had left the the, the true path and went and, and created his own. So um, anyway, so Septaparni uh, Caves is located very near here, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to go and check it out. So just a little bit about Septaparni. Septaparni, I believe, uh, Septa is seven. And Parni is related to leaves, so it's seven leaves. So it's the seven leaves caves. Now, what, what's a plant that's associated with seven leaves? Is, um, you know, the cannabis plant, the hemp plant. Um, it's interesting that, um, I believe it's uh, Terence McKenna, um, who's one of the great thinkers of the late 20th cent century. Um, he, he was a philosopher and um, a, like, uh, I believe a scientist or maybe it's his, his brother is a mycologist, an expert in um, the sciences of the mushroom, but he wrote a very interesting book called Plants of the Gods, um, which I, I consider to be a very, uh, it's the, the sections on thinking about drugs and humans use of drugs um, is fascinating where he looks at, he considers our relationship historically with uh, with opium and opiates, with cannabis, um, with tobacco, with sugar, with coffee, with tea, with television. Um, and it's really a very interesting book. But if I'm remembering correctly, he discussed this, this interesting phenomena where societies who um, had engaged in um, hallucinogenic plant use, like say for instance, in ancient Central and Southern Asia, um, people were using this substance um, called soma. And people have speculated on what soma is or was. And it seems that it may be something related to ayahuasca. Not the same plants, but, a, but compounds where two or more plants are brought together into a substance, a, a liquid that is, is ground out or, or blended together and then the juice is drunk. And then people would have these transformative experiences. Um, so, um, 
So the soma was being used, people were using a variety of mushrooms in Central and Southern Asia and um, the cannabis plants. And then what's interesting is not long after um, these plants are used extensively, humans in, very, in a variety of areas start to develop contem uh, con contemplative or meditative traditions that, that they probably discovered during the plant usages. Um, and there are a variety of ways to attain um, altered states of consciousness through fasting, through abstaining from, from food, from drink, from um, sleep, um, eating, certain, eating particular foods, um, chanting things, observing very closely, deep reading reality can lead to um, expansive or deepened states of mind. And then this transforms the way that we view our daily experience. So, um, so it could very well be, so Septiparni, that cave could be related. It may have been that, uh, that, that hemp plants grew, up, grew wild all over that area. And that's a reason that's remembered. If you happen to know something that might be more historically or linguistically accurate, please share in the comments. But um, I do think there could be something to that that we, that we, we could consider. But at that, at that location, at that cave, 500 monks come together and they recite the, the Buddha's teachings, his words. And in, in the, the original schools of Buddhism, they have what are called the three baskets, the Tipitaka. And the Tipitaka, um, the only Tipitaka that we have in fairly complete form is in the Pali tradition of the Theravada. The Theravada was one of the original 17 or 18 schools of Buddha, Buddha Dhamma. Um, and... Um, we do have incomplete forms of the Tipitaka, I guess that's debatable, up in China, Korea, Japan. So we're just winding our way through the end of, of uh, the bamboo um, garden in Rajgiri. And um, so I went on a little bit of a tangent, kind of lost my train of thought here in the bamboo. See, meditation, you're supposed to attain focus. Um, but what's, what's very interesting is that, um, that in these areas where, where um, Buddha Dhamma arises, um, there had been the Soma tradition and a variety of, of plants that were utilized to attain altered states of consciousness. And then the Buddha himself, my understanding is he rejected um, these, he rejected the use of, of uh, plants and substances to attain altered states of consciousness and did not consider that to be a legitimate way to attain enlightenment. There is much debate within the Buddhist world at this point about, about such usages and, and, and substances. Um, it's worth thinking about. Can we attain enlightenment um, or should we attempt to attain enlightenment purely through natural means or through natural plant means as well? Um, you know, um, so it's some interesting things to, to consider and debate. Um, beautiful plants. Love the bamboos. Such rapid growing plants with so many different usage uses. Um, so anyway, I'll go ahead and, and cut this one short here in the bamboo groves at the bamboo grove in Rajgiri. Peace.